Yes, what I thought we could do is, unlike some of the, you know, the Paytms and Saif and all these guys who everybody knows, your, your companies are relatively new or in fields that not the audience may not know. So maybe we can start by each of you kind of talking about how you got to where you are. It's, give a little bit about the professional stuff and the personal stuff and uh, tell the people about uh, what you've been up to over the last um, couple of years. Anu, um, you're, you have been about water in some ways. Yes. And in many ways, um, it's one of the biggest issues in India and probably going to get worse this year because of the kind of the drought and all of that. Um, ideally, it seems like anybody who comes up with an idea in water should be doing very, very well, right? And the company should be like doing amazingly well. Um, doesn't always happen that there's a big opportunity and then you can solve it. So talk a little bit about um, you, you studied engineering in the US and take it from there. Yes, it is true that you could have a huge opportunity and your company might not be doing so well, which is currently where we're at. Um, I, going back to your question about where uh, the story is, um, I studied uh, engineering at UC Berkeley. I did my bachelor's and my master's. And uh, one of my friends, actually, Next Drop was a complete accident. Um, my friend Emily Kumpel was doing her PhD in Hubli Dharwad, and she was studying the World Bank project. And she was trying to collect water samples uh, to study to see if there was contamination in the water in the non-24 bar 7 areas. And she found she was spending most of her time just waiting for the water to come. So she realized if it was a problem for her, probably a problem for a lot of people. So she brought it back to a class at Berkeley, and she said, well, why don't we just message people when the water turns on? Uh, fast forward four years later, I was just her friend, and I said, oh, I don't have anything to do this summer. OK. Uh, so I did. I graduated early. I worked at a startup in Sunnyvale, near San Francisco. And uh, very soon, it was either next drop dies or I quit my job. And I thought I would get fired anyway. I was not very good at making Excel models. Uh, so I, I quit and moved about four years ago. And um, I think water is something that's both exciting and challenging. And it's something that, if you think about how many water companies exist, you don't have hundreds of thousands of water companies. You only have a couple billion dollar companies. That's it. And so you either have the opportunity to really crack a very hard problem and benefit, you know, extre huge benefits from that, or you die. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a, a black or white situation in this and sector. Just kind of explain how next drop works. So actually, we're kind of in the middle of, I would say, a pivot. How did it work? It, it, we started with a crowdsourcing model. So we said, well, let's crowdsource water availability information from utility members. And it worked as a glorified MVP. And we made a mistake, and we scaled. We tried to scale that too fast. Actually, uh, Karthik was in the audience, one of our friend investors. He was the one who kind of said, hey, does this scale? And that's when we took two steps back, and we said, oh, wait. Usually, no, Karthik is the one that says, scale, scale. <laughs> <laughs> but he's the one who got us starting to think about scale, and that's where we, we kind of are now venturing into the IoT space and the sensor space. Because if you think of water technology um, in the distribution system, that technology has not advanced for hundreds of years. You've made advancements in water treatment for commercial and industrial purposes. But if you think of uh, water loss, which is a huge problem facing most emerging markets, uh, there hasn't really been advancement in that space. So that's the opportunity we're looking at now is using sensors to do that. Okay, so we'll, we'll get back to that point uh, in a bit as well. So, um, Joya, sociology degree, right? Yep. 20, 26 years old, give or take. Um, and you've been doing core diagnostics for three, four years now? Four years now, right. yes. So, just tell us uh, what you've been up to in the last four years. Sure. Um, so first of all, thank you for having me part of this panel. Um, I think it, it's uh, very important that women entrepreneurship gets highlighted um, in, in forums like this, and there aren't too many opportunities, so thank you for that. Um, as far as my background is concerned, uh, I, I think 
there's always, you know, there's always a point at which you look back and say, oh, that's what led me to where I am today. So uh, when I look back, I was brought up by a single mother, um, and I think that really shaped uh, my whole journey. I never in my mind thought that, you know, women were in any way lesser or more uh, than men. Uh, I had a younger brother, and we were treated absolutely equally. My mother was working late hours, so I, I saw that, you know, it was okay uh, for a woman to be just like a man uh, in, in, in every way, since I was like little. So that, that's sort of one, um, I would say, in the back, backdrop, what led me to where I am today. Um, I was working at Google before this, uh, post my sociology, that was my first job. Uh, did that for about two years. I would come back home very often and tell my mother, you know what, I'm not feeling satisfied because uh, while I'm doing a lot of good work, I'm getting promoted, et cetera, et cetera, but there's no you know, real satisfaction. You, you don't feel like you're creating an impact. So my mother said, okay, well, so what do you, what do you want to do? So I said, I want to be an entrepreneur. And <laughs> like all parents of uh, you know, kid, young kids, she looked at me and said, okay, but you know, you can do it a few years from today when you have experience, when you have exposure. I said, yeah, but look at you. You're, she's somebody who's been in the healthcare industry as well. I said, you've been a leader for many years, but you've been working for other people. You could never really drop what you were doing and become an entrepreneur because the risk was too high. You had kids, you had et cetera, et cetera. So I said, this is the right time. Let me do it. And I think uh, looking back four years ago, my mother was probably a very, very um, uh, courageous uh, woman to say, okay, Okay, fine, just quit your job, try it. Uh, and I think that's, you know, just having your parents say try it uh, really, really helps somebody who's young. Did that, uh, started Core, uh, raised our first sound, uh, round of financing in 2012 from a Silicon Valley investor. So Core basically is a company where we are looking at bringing high-end diagnostic testing from across the globe and making it available to Indian patients. Uh, whether it is, you know, for cancer or for heart disease or for gynecological disorders, the whole array. Uh, uh, and we've tied up with various companies uh, globally. We are now raising our second round of financing. We've gone from zero employees to 100 employees, and the you know, rest, as they say, is history. Okay, so we'll circle back to that, um, the business model and the fundraising issue. Um, Duga, startups and digital, and you've, you're just coming off launching the product, right? Startups and digital and books, really? I mean, I thought books are dying. <laughs> and um, e-books are dominated by Amazon. So what is Juggernaut? Okay, so I think uh, all of it, all of what you've said is true, right? I mean, physical books, um, sales are very low. They've just not breached the average 2.5 to 3K uh, number in a really long time. India, I think, has published very few front list titles, which could be one reason also why it hasn't breached that number. Um, so, and, and there's absolutely no data available, right? So there's nothing that compels us in a way to do or actually articulate the problem mathematically very well. Um, but I think both um, um, Cheeky Sarkar, who's my co-founder, and I, um, I think committed it to, in two different ways. I think she has been uh, cyclically sort of terribly frustrated with the constraints of the physical book publishing industry. And I think my, uh, now I see a theme in my life where I think every time I feel like um, mainstream media is being lazy uh, about something. I think there's an opportunity to kind of uh, go in and see if there's a new format to do something. Is there a new price point? Is there, um, why don't we ever look at data? Um, so I think those themes have also now emerged across choices I've made in my life. Um, and I also feel that, um, you know, in the media over a long period of time, we've had a lot of uh, readers, we've had lots of uh, folks who've come and used our products, but we've not built transactional relationships. Um, we've never used a wallet effectively. There are very few products. Um, unlike perhaps the journal um, that, that actually builds loyalty, uh, vertical commerce loyalty. Um, so I think the book publishing problem combined with the smartphone audience in India and a partner who had a, a very strong commercial instinct in addition to a serious reading, um, deep publishing instinct, I think those came together for me when I said, listen, maybe we can look at this problem, expand the reading market, get people to pay a reasonable amount, uh, and just have them try reading a book, and perhaps they like reading um, 10,000 or 15,000 words rather than 500 words. And I think 
if, if, if we get the content right. So that's sort of where we are at, Raju. I don't think we know how big it will be. I think we feel now tentatively confident that there might be a market, uh, at least from five days after launch, we feel there's downloads, there are transactions, there's some repeat use, um, the ARPU is not bad, so I feel like we, we have enough to go with, um, and for the first time we are seeing data of what is it that people read 60 pages of, which I think again is revelatory. Um, so yeah, lots of positives, um, but I, I um, which is why I was wary when I read this whole unicorn business about this pa panel. So I think we're very far away from talking about scale, but I think at least the definition, the problem is getting more sharply defined. So this is, uh, you know, 2016. Yeah. Each one of you has been running a business or has started something or have worked at businesses for several years. At VC Circle itself, the CFO, the editor-in-chief, the um, HR, the head of delegate sales, the CEO are all women. Why are we having this panel? Okay, so this is very rare, right? You should know that. <laughs> um, I think uh, p perhaps media is an exception where I think women have been encouraged a hell of a lot to um, you know, take up editorial posi positions, not necessarily business positions. Um, but I think a couple of reasons, right? So one, um, I was very lucky and came from a family where, you know, my grandmother cycled to college, Mysore State, so I'm a third generation uh, learner. I think it was in uh, Stella where I did my undergrad for the first time that I actually came across uh, first generation learners. Uh, women from Namakkal, Dindigal, a lot of you know interior Tamil Nadu um, who traveled a long way to just come to college. So I think the expectation of a lot of women who are first generation learners is I at least got educated, right? I at least have a job, leave alone saying, listen, am I being treated fairly, right? So I think that that, that understanding of what is a social barrier, uh, I don't think we talk about it enough. Um, in the North, it's completely different, right? Where um, very few women are still encouraged to adopt a professional life as their primary life, right? I think, um, I mean, when we were at Mint, right, um, working with you, I remember managing a team where um, Karwa Chauth was a big deal, right? I had a team member who wanted to take two, three days off, uh, and I was like, why? Why do you have to do that? And, and I, I put so much pressure on her, and she didn't take the day off and she got into a lot of trouble with her family over the next two, three days, right? And I, and f and I realized how short-sighted I'd been in not trying to understand what is the milieu she came from. Um, so one, I think there's a complete lack of empathy in the workplace into the deeper problems that women face. So unless we talk about some of this, I don't think we'll be able to um, even get to the point of encouraging a lot of absolutely excellent smart women to come into the workplace um, and then there's stage two, right? Saying how do I negotiate and get what is fair to me uh, in a competitive environment. Um, again, I think in the media uh, and perhaps banking, you're seeing a lot of women um, compared to some other fields. Uh, we were talking about engineering earlier or coding. Um, like I, I mean, currently running a startup, it's really, really hard for me to employ a woman, right? I've searched, I just don't get enough resumes. Um, so there's definitely, um, like Anu was saying, there are lots of women who go to engineering, but not enough people who come apply for jobs, right? And perhaps we'll talk about this later, it's, it's a certain culture as well. Um, and, and perhaps the other thing that's worrying is, you know, you look at the West saying, listen, this is hugely developed, you know, uh, women are very well educated, there's a lot of money, um, it's a fully enabled digital life, it's not patchy like where we're at, there's a very good investor community, and you see the numbers there, and there too, um, it's predominantly white, predominantly male, um, and, and, and you kind of say, you know, what is it that we are missing? And if there's one thing that I've learned is, I think, multinational, it, things are becoming more multicultural now, right? And I don't think we can build digital products, I don't think we can build companies if we don't have representations of situations, people, and thoughts that are different, right? I don't think uh, we've done enough to, so, so, so unless I've been exposed to certain things, I don't think I will even be receptive to a certain, receptive to a certain kind of investment idea, right? So I think, uh, 
I don't know where to start, right? So I think this is sort of like one very basic step where you start and say, okay, how do we even start talking about it? Uh, but I think we, we really have to be really, really honest about the numbers and honest about what is it that we are doing and truly admit and pledge that we will do more to get uh, women into the workplace, among other things, right? I don't want to like do broad strokes, but I think we definitely have to get I mean, you did a lot in the newsroom, right? You have to get people from different states. You have to get people uh, who are not of a certain kind of culture. Like, you, you simply have to do these things. Otherwise, you won't build a product that can be used by a lot of different people in India. I think it's necessary and it makes business sense. So, Anu, both uh, Turka and Soya talked about, you know, a grandmother or a mother who were of significant influence. Um, how do you deal with a space uh, or a startup or in a sector where there are no role models who look like you? Um, so you've talked a little bit about it before, but just talk about how you go about kind of saying, men don't have that issue because I think for men there are lots of male role models because of the sheer number of them. Um, uh, talk about how you've dealt with that. So I would say even if you are a male, you still might not resonate with any of the role models you see out there. The chances of them finding somebody is a little higher because so, of the sheer volume. Exactly. So I think this is an issue for anybody. Um, but recently I've been uh, kind of experimenting with things about visualization. So if you hear any successful entrepreneur, they talk about visualization. And I, I think what I've realized is you have to be your own role model, whether you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter. And, and the most successful people, Richard Branson, Oprah, um, you know, any entrepreneur that you, you read about, they have these visualizations of where their company is going to be, where they are going to be. And it's not about what they see outside because we're so used to that dialogue of I don't see this and so this is not possible. It's, it doesn't matter what I see. I see my own creation and I manifest my own reality and that's what's gonna happen. And I think just really being cognizant of that and, and practicing that, whoever you are, I think is very useful and, and what breeds the best set of entrepreneurs. It's an interesting um, approach. Uh, Zoya, one of the things that um, just Durga touched on is that when you're speaking to an audience of mostly men, which is a good thing actually, because they are the ones who need to hear it perhaps more. Um, it, it seems like sometimes it's a case being made saying we should just have more women, right? But there are other reasons why having a diverse kind of employee base or a diverse management team uh, is critical, which is around the area of like um, innovation and uh, having ideas. Uh, which again Durga touched on saying that if you're going to sell something and a lot of your customers are women, you can't expect to understand what their needs might be for that product. Has that been your experience in the last uh, three, four years? Absolutely. I, I couldn't um, say it more more strongly. I think a um, couple of things that I can, like when I look back, uh, I reflect and I can, I can touch upon. Uh, the first time I interviewed somebody, right, I was much younger, um, I was not from the healthcare background, I've done sociology, um, you know, so I, and interviewing doctors or even technical staff or other people. Immediately it hit me that unless you have more people that um, are like you um, in any given scenario, credibility is very hard to establish, right? So that's one. If there's no diversity, setting up credibility becomes, becomes hard. Um, the other theme, I think, uh, very importantly, is if you don't have people from other, other places, whether it's women or it is, um, you know, in terms of economic backgrounds or it is in terms of religion or, or, you know, where they come from culturally or nationally, I think ideas become stagnated. Uh, I, I, I come from an industry where, um, I'll say it myself, but it's pretty, pretty corrupt. Uh, lots of unethical practices, lots of things that are going wrong. Uh, it takes somebody from outside side to come and say, hey, you know what, maybe there's another way to do this. Uh, so I think um, if, you, if you don't build that diversity into organizations, organizations become sort of um, lackadaisical in their approach. They continue to do what they've done for many years. Uh, real example, uh, so we, we run a diagnostic center essentially. We don't have any collection centers across the country. Uh, you know, each time I tell somebody that, they say, wait, so how do you collect samples? I'm like, we go to patients' homes and do it, and we do it by default, right? But it took somebody who did not think that collection centers is a given necessity, must happen, 
to say, why not? Why, why shouldn't we just do it, you know, uh, home-based and it'll be cheaper, right? So similarly, having somebody who comes from a different background in any way is definitely useful from an innovation perspective. So I read somewhere about how you went about putting together a team. Um, how much of that had to do with age as well as being a woman? Because I read somewhere that you would get other people to interview people because if they interviewed with you, they wouldn't take you very seriously while you are still hiring them. Correct. <laughs> so uh, the very true. In fact, my first 10 hires, I got, um, if I got my investors and my mother and uh, sometimes the employees to hire, uh, to interview because, you know, I would walk into the room and they'd say, Hanji, we are waiting for so and so and I would say, yeah, that's me. <laughs> so not, not just with, in, uh, uh, with uh, employees, even with customers, you know, walking in. I remember my first few pitches, I would go and walk and the, the guy who was my head of sales, was a male, was, you know, much older. They would continue to talk to him and you know even if I gave my business card they would not even read it so it would only be when I started talking and you know with a certain um, sort of authority that they would say okay you know who are you what do you do right so I think it's um, it's it is a challenge uh, but it's not so much of a challenge in some ways it's even beneficial because after the initial shock value is over you get a conversation which you wouldn't otherwise get I very often you know will walk into a doctor's office who would not otherwise give more than a minute to uh, somebody else would say okay wait sociology Google here what are you doing so it's an interesting story so I think it's what you make of it uh, but yeah as as leaders as entrepreneurs as people who enable that system it's our responsibility to not um, sort of be judgmental about uh, at least our workforce. But yeah, it's definitely a challenge. It, it wasn't easy. So all of you have raised money either through angels or through kind of funds or through nonprofits, uh, you know, foundations. Um, I read somewhere that only about 6% of the VCs in all over the world are women, right? It means 94% are men, and I think in India it's probably a little higher. Have you... Um, has it been more challenging? Have you had people, there was an earlier question from the audience to another panel where they said, why do VCs force you to get a co-founder, right? Have you had occasions when VCs actually look at you and say you need co-founders who are not saying that you need men? Uh, has that been an issue or fundraising is uh, easier, harder? Um, do people tend to take Maybe not in the case of books, Durga, but I'm curious. Um, so I guess my short answer is no, um, because I think, uh, I mean, so far, I think both our early investors were very, very bullish about both the opportunity as well as the team. Um, and early on, I think... Uh, One of your investors in Nandan. Nan right? Yes. Okay. So Nandan and William Bissell, who uh, owns Fab India. Um, and, and I think it also helps, perhaps age is also a factor here that both of us have a track record where we've set things up, we have some execution experience and so on. Um, and even in the last couple of months as I've met more investors and people have reached out, it's actually never come up, uh, Raju. I think, I think the challenge has been more in, um, I mean, so again, when we hired the tech team, um, it was, it was f lots of funny things happened. I remember early on, I was trying to get, um, I was wooing this back end guy, right? And we were on a call and he said, uh, listen, I've never worked for someone who's uh, not been to IIT, right? So I was like, oh shit, like damn, I didn't go to IIT, I couldn't have gone. So I said, yes, um, so I'm thinking, how can we fix that? So I said, well, I did science, right? If that's any sort of, so he said, okay, so, uh, you know, so, so I, so, so he said, how did you get here, blah, blah. So we had st started having this conversation and, you know, I realized over the course of the conversation, I mean, he didn't finally join us, but it was a lot of uh, perception, perhaps a little bit of ignorance, and we had a perfectly nice conversation, and he said, great, um, I'm still, I have, of course, five offers, but I will recommend two or three people, and he recommended someone who we hired, right? But I think it's, it's really hard to, um, I think the non-IIT startup, I think, is, is one bigger hurdle in India, uh, in my mind now. Um, I mean, we have someone from IIT in our startup, but I don't think we hired Saurav because he's from IIT. I mean, he's very exceptional. But um, I think as two women um, sitting there and saying, listen, we, uh, we 
I mean, I definitely, I have a small son, he's like 13 months old, um, so that I get to spend a little bit of time at home is important, so can we build a tech culture even if we work 10 hours and not work um, 18 hours, um, even if we're online? How do we tell these young boys who want to work 18 hours that it's okay to go home at 12 and that's the kind of company it's going to be? Um, we want them to have lives, we want them to be healthy, um, whatever, right? So I think, I think that part, there are absolutely very few startups in India uh, which encourage that kind of uh, culture. So I think that's something which is going to be hard for us, right? Where we say, listen, just because time is not the only factor. Um, so we, we've thought about that a lot, saying how can we build a slightly different kind of company, which is more like Facebook and Google, and not necessarily like um, every single startup in India where, um, in a, in a way, I mean, not to generalize, I'm sure there are lots of wonderful fathers here, but I think m men do get a bit of a free pass when it comes to kids, right? Uh, I don't think they're expected to spend as much time at home, uh, whereas I think women do a lot of uh, that together too. So I think a lot of the male founders, though they're married, have kids, they still spend 24-7 in the office, sleep in the office. It's a very IIT culture, right? This all-night, put, put an all-nighter or something, you know, this whole link go of saying, so, and I don't know why, right, if you spend your time efficiently, why you have to do that. So I think, I think that for me will be a more male culture challenge than I think investors really saying, hey, here are two women and will this work? Um, yeah. Either one of you have anything to add? I, can... um, I completely agree with Durga. I have raised um, one round now and now, you know. It was like talking. five million the first time around and it now is. about 10 you're trying to raise? Absolutely, absolutely. And so I mean, I've met a lot of investors and you're right, um, it didn't strike me, but now that you say it, most have been men. I, I can only think of one woman and, you know, uh, investor that I met in the last, last four years. But having said that, I don't, I never felt uh, that bias come through. Uh, there is one thing though which, uh, you know, sort of drawing from what Durga said, which is pretty important, which I learned way back when I was studying sociology. When you look at matriarchal societies versus, you know, what we are all used to, so patriarchal societies, there are certain things which, uh, you know, matriarchy brings to the table. And I, I'm just drawing an analogy, it's not necessarily one to one, uh, but things like, you know, when, when women are in power, I think a lot of fairness comes into, uh, into the workplace, a lot of uh, empathy comes into the workplace, and new Neuro neurosciences and uh, even sociology both say it could be potentially because of the nurturing instinct. Um, there's, you know, the jury is still out there on that. Uh, but I think so it's extremely important that, um, uh, you know, we, we take those things that women bring to the table and sort of integrate them into the male-dominated workplace and, you know, that I think is a much bigger challenge. Completely agreed. Uh, Just one small thing, uh, Raju. So one point of, uh, one piece of feedback that I've gotten that's always made me feel happy uh, from those who also worked in other startups is that um, they've all said that both of us are very inclusive in our vision, uh, that we articulate what it is that we want to do and we build the vision along with all of them. Unlike a lot of the other big startups of India where I think founders keep the vision sort of close and in their heads. Um, so I think that's one thing that I'm sort of fairly proud of. Now on the funding front, actually, because of all the pressure, especially in Silicon Valley, it's also now turning out to be a bit of a benefit to be a woman entrepreneur because there are a lot of the women-only funds. So that's great, actually, because it's a little bit of a leveling of the playing field because all the other funds were not called men-only funds, but that's what they operated as, right? Um, Anu, a lot of... I mean, startups are a lot of pressure, right? especially for founders, especially if the business model is not working out. And I'm going to generalize here, but if you look at um, a Vijay Shekhar or if you look at a Kunal Payal or Tipinder from Zamato, they are on social media and they are talking, but oftentimes it's about kind of the business or it's about kind of somewhat more macho kind of things. But do you feel, and you write um, a rather personal blog, which is public, uh, you talk about you know, getting knocked down and getting up and getting knocked down again. You talk about stress eating and you talk about things that my sense is male founders usually don't talk about. Um, is that a coping mechanism or do you feel like women just tend to be better at kind of articulating the whole balance of issues? I don't know if women are better, but the only time I've really heard this conversation. I, I think 
I've mostly heard this conversation on women panels. And I don't think that's necessarily fair because I think everyone has stress. And the only time I hear um, kind of this conversation in other contexts is horror stories of this person committed suicide. This person was incredibly stressed and quit his job. They just burned out. And so I think that this is a conversation that needs to be had. And I think that maybe we are lucky in that women get asked this question. I think you pointed that out. And we get to talk about it maybe because it's a forum, but I think everyone needs to have this conversation because we're all human beings and we all undergo stress and we all have to deal with stress. And I think when people don't have that ability to do that, you do things that are really unhealthy. And as an entrepreneur, you absolutely have to have coping mechanisms, otherwise you're, you're not gonna survive. You know, and I think we've seen ample instances of that happen. And I've talked to a lot of my entrepreneur friends, and everybody has that. If you haven't had a suicidal thought as an entrepreneur, you're like, that doesn't exist, you know? It, how many entrepreneurs have you heard actually talk about that? But it's true. If you ask behind closed doors, that happens. And, and I think it's a huge issue, and it's starting to, people are talking about it in Silicon Valley, and um, I think it's gonna come to India as well, but it's an important issue for the health of the company and for the health of every employee there. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask them one more question and come to the audience, so have your questions ready. Um, there's a pipeline issue, right? I mean, uh, for a long time, there's been a pipeline issue of not enough computer science, um, women doing that. But those things are being, I think, somewhat addressed. Um, the sheer number of women engineers, and I, I know you mentioned that earlier as well, um, the volume is here in, in, in India, right? There's, if you go to universities and if you go, there are lots of women coming out of it. Do you feel like the pipeline issue will force kind of men and male entrepreneurs and startups to kind of actually pay a lot more attention anyway? Because most of the job candidates five years out for a lot of these jobs will probably be women because of the sheer number. Um, or do you think that as, as people who kind of are responsible for hiring, um, you ought to be much more proactive uh, in going out to business schools and engineering schools and kind of making a case for more women to be entrepreneurs and come to startups? Any, any of you? All of you? Um, so I think what I've noticed um, in the three, four sort of startup scenarios I've been in is um, like, I mean, unlike an editorial sort of uh, a newsroom where people talk a lot, they change each other's minds, there's a lot of socializing, right? In the, I think in the tech workplace, you come in, you wear your headphones, um, you know, you work a lot. So what is familiar is easier. Um, so I think if, if you're uh, a certain bunch of guys who have a certain culture, who know each other, who are batch mates, like it, it kind of, it's, it's an easier uh, culture to sort of sustain, right? And I think that has developed. And here I speak about the newer startups because I see Mr. Gopal Krishnan sitting here and perhaps Infosys is very different. But I think in the newer startups, um, there's definitely a very much a, a, a bohomi with, with a certain, like a lot of IIT Delhi, a lot of IIT Bombay, a lot of a certain engineering college, right? Um, and I think unless we sort of consciously A, say that might not be the best kind of culture and try and inject a little different thinking and also bring in product management as a very active part of the technology conversation. Um, I think product management is a great entrance point for diversity to come in uh, rather than only engineering. I think then again the team sees, um, and I'm going to say a very stereotypical thing, you know, you'll get an excellent designer who's a woman come in and have a very, very real feature-based conversation with you which changes your mind. So you, you, I think you'll have to create ways to bring in diversity without it being in your face because at the end of the day, Raju, practically you have to bring out a product. You know, this is all very well. But, you know, you have a business to run, you have deadlines, you have to bring out a product, and you're going to hire the, you know, you, and, and at this stage of our life, um, when we have to do build after build after build, I honestly don't know how much time I spend thinking about what is the right thing to do rather than what is the wisest thing to do given our constraints, right? Um, but I think you, you, I think product management design 
are two great ways to bring in diversity. Um, and I think engineering, we just have to try very, very hard to change the existing culture that is very, very male and IIT oriented to something that is broader. Um, when I say IIT, it's still led by IIT. And here is not to diss IIT people, right? It's just been a very predominant sort of glorified culture, which I hope will change a bit. Can I add to that? Yeah, sure. So uh, I think um, very valid. Once more women, you know, candidates come in, obviously it will solve the problem to some extent. But I think um, as as people that are running organizations, we also have to create spaces that encourage that. So I'll give you an example. Uh, at our startup, we have no offices, right? In healthcare, that's that's not heard of, right? Of course, IT it's a given. But the moment you go to healthcare, the doctor is is the doctor, and the technician is the technician, and you know, so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, what we did was we said, okay, you know what, we will have no offices, we'll have all open space. And that, uh, to a large extent, has, I, I don't know how much integration is brought between women and when, men, but definitely between people of different experiences and exposures. I have seen over time, everybody eats lunch at the same place, uh, and, and now we are about 50 people that work in the same office, and everybody eats there, everybody sits in the same place, there's no, everybody has the same laptop. And I think those are things that we need to think about structurally. Uh, Unless uh, we create processes and systems that encourage diversity without making people feel singled out or, you know, sort of put in little groups, uh, I think we'll never be able to get there. Great. Uh, Durga, Zoya, Anu, thank you so much. This was great.